Close your eyes and ask yourself, do you own enough Bitcoin for you, your family, and the next generation? Well, unless you're Michael Saylor, you don't because no one does. But that can change today. You see, there's a 90% chance of a Bitcoin spot ETF being approved in the next 90 days. So how do you use this near-term opportunity to 10X your sets? Well, in this video, we're strategizing specific ways to make and secure gains before, during, and after the ETF is announced. So join our crypto analysts, Ben Lilly, JJ Ray, and Cody, as they share their insights on when to get in, how long to hold, and when to exit. And trust me, you don't wanna miss this once in a lifetime opportunity. Let's get started. Okay, my favorite crypto brain trust, I'm glad you're in the studio. This is, as I just said, an amazing opportunity for anyone who's in crypto, and for those who aren't, it's time to get in. I wanna ask the question right now, it's before the ETF's gonna get launched, could happen as soon as this week. I don't know. We don't know. But how do you play this now? What are you doing right now to start preparing for that moment? Maybe it's the 2x to 3x right now, and then the rest of those gains happen afterwards. JJ, I'm going to kick it off to you, and then I want everyone just to dive in. So what are you doing right now, JJ? All right. Well, if you want to outperform BTC, if you're denominating BTC and you want to ultimately stack more BTC, you can do that in two ways. One is buy beta. Alt switch would outperform to the upside, which we cover in our uh, beta plays, and I'm sure Danny and the guys here will have more insight on, or two, actively trade BTC. If you're actively trading BTC and using history as a guide here, what you want to do in order to accumulate more BTC ahead of the spot ETF is buy the rumor and sell the news. It's kind of an old trope in markets, but it's true. And we see this, mm -hmm. uh, if we pull up these charts here, we see in 2017, using this as an example, uh, when the Bitcoin futures were approved for trading on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So that notice of approval came in October, uh, late October 2017, when Bitcoin was trading at around 5,200. And then by December 17th, 2017, when those futures went live, Bitcoin was already up at 19,500. Yeah. So that just shows how markets get ahead of these things, right? Like everybody knows that this future wave of liquidity is coming and they get ahead of the move. We saw that right again. there. You could even just get a 4X if you played that right. Yeah, just like that. So if you were just to buy that rumor and then sell it the day those futures went live, you would have gotten a nice return in a BTC denomination there. And then interestingly enough, uh, it happened again in 2021, right? We saw CMA futures ETF was approved in late October once again. Do we have a second chart here, producers? Oh, there's, yeah. Bring, there bring up the yeah. chart. I want to see that. All right. Well, <laughs> walk us through what we have here. So this, again, it's the uh, monthly chart of Bitcoin. And we can just see um, the October 14th, 2021, CME's futures ETF was approved for launch and Bitcoin's around 52,000. And then obviously it had that blow off top to 69,000 when those futures eventually went live. So that just shows you it's kind of a good guide to be out of the way, out of your position by the time this ETF does go live. But you will probably be exposed to some additional gains getting ahead of it because that liquidity unlocks. It ultimately brings in more demand, a lot of retail focus, and everybody that's been paying attention to these things. Like if you were watching markets since August, we all knew this ETF was inevitable. Now there's 90% odds for approval by January. So that get, that's your window of opportunity, right? I believe Bitcoin was like 26,000 or so the day that Grayscale won their SEC case. And now we're already trading at, um, we, well, we had a big correction today, but trading at around 35,000. And that just shows you kind of, if you time these things correctly, get in and out position, you can really stack, grow your Bitcoin stack tremendously by playing these catalysts Pro correctly. Producer, can you bring that chart back up? That last one you just had up? That October move is really impressive. I mean, at the time, the market was starting to cool down. A lot of these metrics were starting to show the whole market was overheated and already starting to correct itself. And you still had that aggressive of a move over that short time period. I mean, that's really impressive because you go back to the previous one and you almost had a 4X there, which is understandable because I think that futures kind of took a lot of people by surprise. They weren't expecting a sort of institutional product to roll out. And it was hurried from my understanding in terms of the rollout. But this one, this one was really just a futures-based ETF and it was anticipated and it still knocked the socks off the market. 
it's mm. impressive how um well you have to think like these people are selling a product right they're not gonna they're not in the business of selling things that are dead so they're it's in their best interest to do like cnbc like we've been seeing with larry fink and whatnot of going out there and actually selling this and getting people to want to allocate it to their portfolio unfortunately it turns out that most of the time those people end up being exit liquidity but that's essentially your window of opportunity as kind of a more advanced speculator in these markets looking mm. to accumulate more bitcoin so so your play is just to buy the bitcoin now and hold it out until the actual announcement yeah that's like we were saying there was a big washout today right like this mm -hmm. whole week um there was kind of the news that approval could come as soon as uh, November 17th, which I believe is Friday. So we saw a lot of speculation get ahead of that. Open interest levels uh, went extremely heated, and then they all got wiped out. So if you're going to be speculating this fashion, obviously, I wouldn't recommend be doing it with high leverage. But I think uh, you still won't be adding on dips until we do uh, inevitably get that approval, which seems very likely by January. So I, I Think they'll be rewarded if you're kind of buying the dips um maybe not in this range but over the next month or so into that inevitable approval mm -hmm. i want to ask uh how how much juice do you guys think is left in in this trade because uh, i think since the quote-unquote mishap by the coin telegraph intern the price has moved like 40 percent already i were trading 27k it went up as much as 38k so i think a lot of that potential move has already happened um so how, how do, what do you think is reasonable uh for like how much higher we can trade there's definitely a lot of it priced in without a doubt and this is an interesting nuance because this time we've had so much time to front run this news like like i said everybody's known basically since grayscale won their sec case this is going to be inevitable so how much of that is priced in it's hard to say um one thing that is encouraging is that we see open interest is lower it's basically at march levels now after today so we've been seeing that excessive speculation continue to get wiped out and price is still higher and i don't think we've seen a whole bunch of retail presence yet i think that final wave is still yet to come and i think that could push us over 40k but it is definitely a risk factor yeah i'll, I'll jump in too and say that i think the rumor was actually bought in june um because i had a few data points to allude to it just to address what Cody was saying, uh, if you producer, I think I dropped a chart that we could pull up on the GBDC discount or premium to nav. Nice. Uh, and if you go to the second one that I had, you know, just note that this was almost at like negative 50%, which means the value of all the Bitcoins held by the trust compared to the total value of all the shares that represent that trust, those shares are worth half the amount of all the Bitcoin being held. So that's a complete dislocation in the market. But back in June, this changed from negative 43%, so call it negative 44%, all the way to negative 26% in the span of like three weeks. Like this was the biggest move I've seen in the NAV in a very long time. And if you were to value that percentage around, I think around at that time period, you could kind of average the price out to be around 28,000. This NAV change represented more than $3 billion worth of value of Bitcoin. And so that's just, that's a lot of demand. So like the question of how much juice is left on this move, I think is, is worth diving into. Because right now you got negative almost 12% which that's almost worth at current prices, just short of 3 billion. And so this all NAV has got to close up, right? In my mind, like I think all that, I do think it's going to drop when we had the ETF launch, just because of exactly what you're saying. There's just so much supply now. And then where's that demand going to come from? But I do think it's going to come ultimately, sadly, from people's retirement portfolios and whatnot that get sold these things as soon as they go live. And we saw that with like Bido the futures ETF when that went live, there was actually a tremendous amount of volume the first day and then it just fell off a cliff. Like basically people were kind of buying the top there unwittingly. Uh, a lot of it was probably in retirement accounts and whatnot. And I think that that retail presence is usually the final wave of liquidity. And I don't think we've seen that yet. Could be wrong. Like maybe this is the top of the rally. That's it. But I do think we'll see a final leg if and when the ETF is approved, probably above 40K. Mm -hmm. Would I bet a lot on that? No, but I, I do think it's um, 
a very real pro- probability based on like the open interest isn't even that heated yet at this current level. It was earlier, but got wiped out again. And typically, like when we see these big tops, you see open interest remain elevated. Like people are anxious to buy the dip on leverage. And that does that impulse doesn't seem there yet, which that's encouraging to me from like a market structure perspective for now. Yeah, I think it will get overheated too. I agree with you. OI is going to pop like a rocket here. And there's definitely a cohort that wants that too. Like I think I had a whales chart that showed in, in that same time period in June. Like there was some solid accumulation on spot taking place in the chart here. It just shows it's a bunch of dots on a chart. The dot color represent what the price of Bitcoin is trading at. So it's kind of, it's not very intuitive. It's kind of hard to kind of comprehend that, but these kind of darker purple colors uh, in kind of magenta, this is like 30K region. But then as the dots start to rise, that indicates that there's some whale accumulation taking place. And just as that you know, $3 billion worth of demand showed up on the Grayscale Trust, you also had a lot of spot accumulation take place with some whale wallets. And so that that cohort, I have to imagine, is is waiting to sell that news. And yep. it almost reminds me of like 2018 with all the mainnet launches with all these altcoins and everybody was just front running them. And as soon as the mainnet was, was released, it was it was over. But that was the big <laughs> quote fundamentals of crypto events that took place. But like think of how much money they'll make if the ETF goes live and Bitcoin's trading near fifty thousand, right? Like all these institutions that were buying up to have supply to sell to uh, retail retirement accounts and portfolios, et cetera. They're not going to make a whole lot of money if Bitcoin just crashes now, but it's very good for business if they build a lot of FOMO into that event and then can sell those um, that supply much higher. Yeah, I agree. And, and I'm curious actually what Ray has to say, because you know he follows miners a lot closer than I think the rest of us do. And I know I had my eyes in terms of like, how could we look at this pre-ETF approval phase as possibly getting a 2x on your sats? You know, where are you looking? You know, options market, I think it's a little bit more difficult uh, to go ahead and play that in terms of the timing. But the miners look like they kind of retraced a lot of their movements over the last few months. Um, and as far as like getting a 2x, 3x pop with an ETF news, I know gold is kind of the analogy that a lot of people like to use and that the miners went ahead and just went insane, right? Because the price is now starting to move. So the margins of miners are starting to increase. And it, of course, legitimizes a lot this asset class for the masses. But I'm kind of almost wondering what Ray thinks as well, because I think he's got a little bit closer of a, a take on, on the industry. I think Bitcoin miners are a no-go in the short term. I think that trade is over um, until an ETF is approved. I mean, there a lot of them did 250 to 300% this year or year to date. And, um, you know, the, the logic is that Bitcoin miners, one, they were really oversold uh, because of all the debt issues and just the market meltdown with Bitcoin 3AC Celsius and all that. But I think one of the narratives was investors could get exposure to Bitcoin um, by using miners as a proxy. And that's been done. But with the spot ETF potentially being approved, then it's going to be more attractive just to go and get spot Bitcoin and hold that um, over the long term, I think that's what the logic is for retail and maybe for the sophisticated or institutional investor also. And with the having coming up, um, you know, a lot of miners are going to be under certain levels of distress depending on their capital cost and their operational cost. So, um, I think the, the way to look at which miners might be the good ones to invest in are, who's using renewable energies and who has the lowest power contract, what percentage of one's operations um, are based on renewables. Some of the guys said 30, some of the mining executives said that 30% is the starting point that uh, miners need to be looking at in order to, um, in order to survive into the having. So I think we'll see a lot of, Kind of volatility and people sitting off sides with miners until after the halving occurs, and then we can see you know what miners are producing, which amount of Bitcoin at what cost, how profitable are they, 
how do um, how does the stock price respond to that? What sort of mergers and acquisitions occur? What's the Bitcoin hash rate doing? Uh, what is Bitcoin price doing itself after the halving and potentially with the uh, approval of a Bitcoin ETF? So um, I think that's kind of what's front of mind for everyone. And that's why you don't see a lot of engagement with Bitcoin mining stocks at the moment. Coin really is interesting to see how um, beat term. down they gotten yeah. recently, right? Like they haven't even broken their summer highs, most of them. So they yeah. put them, like, kind of blow off tops in the summer and now they're just like chilling 30 to 50% lower. Some oh, I'm 55, 60, down to 90%. Like these things yeah. look absolutely beaten down and hated. I think there's a dilution risk also because to raise debt in this QT environment or to get funding, um, some of these miners have a track record of issuing more shares um, and then they go buy miners and that sort of thing. So if I can be involved in a, if I can hold spot Bitcoin or if there's an ETF, which I think might be approved soon and that's going to become an option for me, I can't be diluted on my Bitcoin position. Whereas I can always be diluted on my, mining stocks position and with the having coming up and profitability coming under concern for a lot of these miners that kind of heightens the risk of that they're going to use dilution as a bootstrap um, option so even if we have a successful having and uh, an etf is approved I, th I just think there's kind of multiple outlets for liquidity um, to go and look at other aspects of the crypto market instead of Bitcoin miners. So their balance sheets and profits are going to, going to have to kind of demonstrate that they're robust and resilient in order to incentivize any sort of investment to come back with the same sort of furor that you saw earlier in the year. So Wall Street Ray, would I'll, never I'll, do that to loop Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> Ray, I want, I want to bring on you for suggesting it. Yeah, I want to bring the, the question back to you, Ray, and ask, okay, so if, if Bitcoin miners aren't a way to, to be able to stack more uh, sats, are you looking at other uh, crypto equities, or do you have in your mind a different trade that you're looking at right now uh, before the ETF is approved? I wouldn't throw Bitcoin miners out. Like I, I'm not saying, Ben, that's a terrible idea, but if you had to split up your portfolio, your investment powder... Uh, into different cohorts, then I would put the Bitcoin miners right now, if they're looking oversold, I would put that into a higher risk category and um, kind of have a conservative allocation in that regard because you're expecting an outsized gain on that investment. So if I had like 10,000 bucks, I might only put like 2,000 into Bitcoin mining stocks right now mm -hmm. um, and then just kind of see how that performs and adjust as as time goes by. Um, do I have a different strategy for maximizing, uh, for getting a 10 X on Bitcoin? It's multi-tiered. So, um, my, yeah, I was going to say, so, yeah. So, so right now, what are you looking at before the ETF approval? What are you looking at right now? Uh, yeah. To, in support of that 10 X. I think it's important to be nimble and stay liquid and play the momentum and let the trend kind of dictate what you do. So, um, my strategy assumes that you already have some spot exposure to Bitcoin, at least at $23,000 when it was trading there or below. Uh, it also assumes that you're doing some sort of dollar cost averaging weekly, monthly, you know, whatever you can afford. Um, that way the pressure to be trading all the time is kind of reduced. So with that in mind, um, I would be playing the momentum. So with price breaking down to this 34K level today, um, there's already people that are talking about that's a good go long opportunity, but my kind of like macro vision for Bitcoin price action is that until an ETF is approved, price is going to range between thirty thousand dollars per coin and forty five to fifty five thousand dollars per coin in an ETF list world, right? So that's a pretty wide range to just play that momentum to the upside and downside. So. Um, you know, I, I'm looking to go long at 30K. I'm looking to go okay. long at 32K. Um, I would love to go long from, you know, 26K or something if there's some crazy flush out, um, depending on how order books look and where the leverage exists. 
Um, like we had this gamma squeeze from 32K to 36K. Then we had another one from 36K to 38K. So depending on gaps in liquidity and where there's like the potential for shorts to get flushed out, um, I will place orders at breakout. So, okay. you know, previously, like two weeks ago, when price hit 36.3K, I opened along all the way up to 38K because that's where the liquidation maps showed a gap. So you can it's play like within that trade, range. Ray. Like if you were to if you were to just jump in and try to do a two, three X on one thing, what would that be? Because I know you can always actively trade ranges and attempt to stack stats in that regard, but I don't know if the average individual would be kind of actively trading from a day-to-day basis. Well, since the goal is to get a 10X, that means you've got to be a little bit more oh, active. Word. So um, I would say for a trader looking to like build their Bitcoin bag, just buying um, buying the lower support test, retest off of kind of cascading liquidation wicks um, and then leaving that in Bitcoin, pulling your principal and continuing to um, continuing to like apply that into future trades. Because one thing I think that people kind of forget is that Bitcoin doesn't move on our timeline. So people have a tendency to YOLO into like a Bitcoin position, position on major dips. They put all their capital, whether it be into a spot position or into leverage based off of what Larry Fink says, based off of what influencers say, based on this looking like the last dip before the train leaves the station. And, you know, Bitcoin price action does what it wants when it wants. And I think a lot of traders find themselves sidelined with insufficient capital or their hands are tied up or they're in a red position. So um, okay. I think being nimble is the way to go. So, so you want to so trade with size. Will outperform, right? Do you see any, like, sorry, do you see any opportunities in alts right now to outperform Bitcoin? I like that Danny brought that up. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, but then I think you strap on a lot more risk and you need to understand the market a lot better. So sure, you can trade DYDX and Arbitrum and all the Arbit- Arbitrum ecosystem assets that are mooning because of this new like, this new like incentive thing they have, like Pendle and Arb and there's some other sure. assets, Camelot and whatnot. Sure. But sure, oh, oh. you can like triple up your gains, but I think you you're at risk of like which one taking do you on more like losses. Best? As a to outperform BTC, is there any you have in mind that would outperform BTC pre ETF? Uh, uh, that's tough because I I have to be honest and say that's difficult because I I like piled into all these things five six months ago and into AVAX and Solana and all those assets. So on the wick up to thirty eight k, I took profit on all those positions and closed them. So. It's hard Let's, for me yeah. as we now are resetting. Okay, well, I, to say what's going to like outperform in the future. I want to, I want to, I want to bring us back a little bit here. So I think Ray, I'm going to summarize what you have. Is is we hope you had you went you were back in time. You had some exposure. This is by the dip season. It may be difficult unless you want active trading. Uh, and then I contrast that with what JJ so far has said, which is you know buy buy uh, buy now and then sell when we actually get into the ETF. But I, I think I, I'm going to. I, th- I think that would be a good summary of you because I, I do want to give some time to Cody, who's kind of sitting here on the sidelines uh, to talk a little bit about the trade we just talked about. Because I know we were just talking about alt. So, Cody, jump in here. I want to hear a little bit more about your ideas. How are we getting to this 10x from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, as you guys said, um, I think alts are the way to go. I think if you want a 10x, you can either go full leverage in Bitcoin, uh, but I like to slip. A slide. So I'd rather take a spot position on an outcome that I think is going to overperform. And I think that outcome right now is going to be Solana. Um, I think that, well, we made the case on the Solana beta play, so I'm not going to repeat all the points, but like the TLDR for me is Solana was depressed price-wise because of the FTX debacle. It was sold into oblivion and kind of forgotten by pretty much everyone in crypto. Um, and most you, though, you've, you've been talking about it. Back. I was going to say you've been talking about this for six months now, so I'm going to give you kudos to you. I think you were, you you were raising the flag, saying, "Hey, it's time to look at Solana for a while." Yeah, I remember talking about it uh, with uh, JJ when it was trading at eight dollars, uh, and like I, I kind of want to kick myself because yeah, like I didn't buy there, but I, I did buy as it 
recovered from that and like it looked like the the, the worst was behind us right um yeah. and i think basically the the the, the, the hypothesis like the thesis for solana is um it is the only credible alternative to the evm and modular worlds um i think the crypto market is like over indexed to to the modular future and the evm i think solana is the only alternative with any um ac activity and the developer um yeah any activity from retail or like from people using the chain and developer activity um one thing that was great to see was that even though price wise solana was indicator there were a lot of people both uh, at the core level working on improving solana chain and at the product level working on the products that are going to attract new liquidity and people to use solana so, so I Cody, think, I, I know yeah. we, we just had an episode where we talked about some of those elements regarding the technology. And I think uh, for any of our listeners, you can go see a video with Soul versus ETH and why we think it will outperform. But help me out a little bit more why you're thinking now with some of the data, because I know you mentioned off, offline that you're, you're saying there's, there's additional information even since that recording, which makes you even more bullish on Soul to get your 10x. So I want, I want to hear from that. Yeah, I think everyone uh, was kind of expecting for Solana to underperform um, like for the last few months. And the reason is that a lot of, uh, like the F FTX state holds a lot of soul or used to hold a lot of soul. Um, a lot of the um, tokens that were recovered from Alameda and FTX were Solana or Solana based tokens. And these were said to be sold or like that they are still being sold and they are still being unlocked as they become available, because uh, like a lot of the tokens that they are holding um, were purchased with a locked uh, time, like, like they were purchased as a venture capital, and those are still being unlocked. But the unlocked portion of those Solana tokens has basically been sold completely. Um, ever mm -hmm. since it was announced that uh, i think it was i believe it was galaxy uh that was going to be the market maker uh tasked with selling those unlocked tokens they started sending um coins to exchanges in mid-october and if we look at the price or sorry at the chart that must have been in october we were playing at around like 18 19 dollars and that proved to be a bottom. And it proved to be a bottom because people were like going, or like traders were betting on Solana going down. So they weren't uh, short on it. Funding rate went high like crazy. That means that those traders that were short were paying um, to keep those short positions open. And there was demand from spot. So people buying actual coins that drove price up. And we see that price has regained. USD wise has regained the levels from the uh, FTX collapse around thirty dollars, and BTC wise, which is the next one, uh, next chat if we can go there, producer, it's yeah, it's knocking on that door as well, mm. and yeah, um, as far it's a bit difficult to track all the addresses for the FTX state, that's because uh, some of those or like most of them were like labeled, but they have been reshuffling, as far as I can tell most, if not all, of the unlocked soul that they held has been already sent to exchanges. If we go to the next um, next image, we see the inflows. And since mid-October, uh, there's been like almost 13 million sold, sold sorry, sent to exchanges. We need to, we do not know for sure that it has been sold, but the likeliest, uh, the, 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 it, it's likely that it has. Like otherwise, they would not have kept selling uh, or the sending sold to those centers exchanges. So yeah, if we take the view that has that has been sold already, that means that all the sell pressure that people fear that was going to sell send sold again maybe to single digits has been removed from the picture. So it it, it was one of those things that like everyone could see. The, the the supply side, so the, the amount of sold that was gonna be sold, but no one was no one was taking into consideration the demand side, and that's because the demand side is much more difficult to to gauge. Like you don't really have numbers, and it's like oh yeah, someone is gonna buy this many sold. Um, but I think it has been proven over the last two months that like the demand side is actually much greater than the supply side. So Cody, you're, you're making the case that uh, there's a lot of demand. There's uh 
for, for Seoul. So, and, and I think, are you suggesting that now is a good time to DCA into Seoul to, for you to help with that 10x? Is that is that kind of the strategy that you're looking at? Yeah, I think you kind of have to wait a bit to see if you have a, a pullback. I think maybe it's a good idea to start saying if if you don't have a position open. Uh, I'm I'm not looking to add significantly at these levels. Like as I said, even though FTX State was selling, price has gone up from like eighteen dollars uh, up to like fifty five more more or less that we are right now. It was as much as. 60 64 or 65 at some point so i think you kind of want to to see a pullback or at least some consolidation between uh 50 and 40 ideally you you get a pullback to that uh high time frame support like around um yeah the 35 level anything around those levels or anything around on the bitcoin side around 0 0.001 uh that would be like yeah, you, you kind of have to go all in at those levels. Um, mm. And yeah, that to me is the ideal scenario. Uh, otherwise, just DCA, because uh, it seems like it's taking a breather. Um, we've seen a lot of peop- a lot of traders betting on that continuation for Solana and funding rate increasing. So now I think it's the longs that are um, that are in a dangerous position, much as the shorts were like back at $18. So I think it's best to to wait for that uh that or those long late. yeah exactly buy the plot and profit later mm. i'd offer a contrast and opinion here because this thing scares the bejesus out of me <laughs> I, I, Let's hear it. so <laughs> yeah so we saw what grayscale did to the market right that was pretty much 2021 is 2020, 2021, 2022. It pretty much just took a massive machete and just chopped everybody into pieces. And we see this same playbook happening again. Like just going through the recent filings, like it's got a lot of activity at the end of October and early November. And then of course you look at the timing of the recent conference and then you look at the recent activity on the price action for Solana and this thing is scary. Like 0.38 right now in terms of the amount of Solana per share in each share, it says market price per share is $150. Um, I think this is updated end of day, so it actually might be higher at the moment. But you know that implies that we're over $400 per Solana right now on the grayscale trust and we see this playbook. So if I'm looking at all these filings, which the names are not getting disclosed here, and you're telling me the FTX state, a state went ahead and unloaded it. I understand we got the inflows into the exchanges, but this is a lot of Solana we're talking about. Like I think we just I think this is where it ends up. It was trading at eight hundred and sixty nine percent premium on the thirteenth for the Solana Trust. Yeah. That is like outrageous I, i'm not say, telling anyone to buy a grayscale solana product because it would be quite quite like it would not be smart at all but i don't think the the grayscale solana trust can have basically any impact whatsoever on solana price as a whole because it's tiny uh it's asset under management at six million mm-hmm. you're talking about uh an eight nine billion dollar coin no sorry that was that was that was two months ago i think we're we're at like 24 billion dollars in market cap right now six million is, is nothing the, the, the issue with grayscale and the ptc product is that it was much much bigger in the orders of billions of dollars so that that was uh even for bitcoin that that, that was quite a lot of of sell pressure um but for solana i i, I don't think so like the sol sol that has been sent to centers exchanges it's as I said thirteen million at its prices. It would be what uh, over four hundred five hundred million something like that. So yeah, like six million compared to that is it, it, peanuts. How did that even happen? That the trust went up so much was that just retail buying it for some reason rather than buying the outright sol? Well, I mean, I know it shows that it's got. 304,000 shares outstanding right now. But if you look at the SEC filings, so I think it's a lot more, but a number of shares or other units to be sold, 1,000. Okay, so that's a drop in the bucket. 
this one's 500, this one's 400, this one's 400. It's very tiny. It's very tiny. But yeah, to your point, it is it is small. But I have to imagine when it comes to FTX and what's going on with the estate, I have to imagine there is some conversation because you can't unlock that soul. And we're talking about a lot of demand that's going to somehow eat up all of that Solana. Like I personally, I, I'm a little skeptical, right? I think a lot of this was the conference. I think a lot of the demand that took place in that market was yeah. almost anticipating that estate sale, but it might not have actually even happened. It might have just kind of moved hands uh, with some sort of contract agreement. That that's what worries me. I mean, it's, it's those things that you don't tens, quite so. know. Right. I think you're made yourself out of a good state, Ben. No, it's <laughs> I'm scared of it, man. I'm just scared. <laughs> it scares me. You're right. It might just keep going up. It could pass every layer one within the top ten, but it still scares. I think scares I think Cody's saying he wants twenty x, ten x is nothing. He's he's ready to go in and strap on to the ride and just just go wherever it takes him. But we should appreciate, yeah. you know, this is yeah. risk. You have to take yeah. on risk, right? Yeah, and Solana exactly. has a lot of risk associated with it. And so, like to Cody's point, like, how are you going to 10x Bitcoin right now? What are you going right. to do? You know, and cool. I know Cody spent a lot of time diving into that ecosystem. Right. Yeah. 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 And there's another point that I would like to raise is that the the unlocked soul to to hit uh, liquidity is not that high up in. Up until like 2025. Um, I think if producers, we can look at the, the next uh, image. Yeah, there we go. So there's like 2.5 million soul um, left to be unlocked from here until January. That is like one fifth of the soul that has been sent to exchanges by, by Galaxy. And then up until 2025, there's like 13 or 14 million soul also left to unlock. And that's the same amount uh, of soul that has been sent to exchanges over the past two months. So it is, uh, like, don't, don't get me wrong, like, there is supply coming, but it is not that's something still not that, a lot, like, right? It's like 500 it's not million that, or something in circulation. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, like, I think we saw something very similar during the um the ICO boom or unbust um for Ethereum, right? So during that we saw I think it was difficult to get data for that for this. But I think ICOs 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 sorry yeah got as much as like almost ten percent of the supply at the time. It, it was something outrageous. And that was sold during the, the twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen bear market and also probably in 2020 like i know some some um projects like argon and golem that still hold a lot of it from them and sometimes yeah, people thought they, that would be a death spiral there. there's a lot of similarities yeah. there where people thought like exactly. how can we overcome this massive uh, amount of supply that's just hanging overhead and now look at yeah. it right? And if you look at inflation, uh, it was also very similar. Like right now for Solana, you have inflation at 7.1%. Uh, inflation back then for ETH was around 5%. So you have like a very similar um, very similar setup. The market caps also are quite similar. Like you got uh, down to 12 billion for ETH and it rose then to 570 billion for Solana. There's also like a sustainability percent. factor though that's taken place with the ICOs for ETH because that ETH was getting sold to pay salaries, to pay developers, to pay really projects or even possibly fund additional projects. But like what's, think, what's soul think, doing for Solana? I think a lot of that ETH was sold for parties and, and by people <laughs> buying Lamborghinis. And, and Don't disagree. Like, I'm like, trying to stay positive and optimistic here. <laughs> No, no, yeah, like we to be fair, like I, I think some of that for sure was was used by developers to 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 fund the the what's the name the the whole ecosystem, but I think that's also happening on Solana, right? Uh, that that's why I, th I see so many similarities. It's just it's 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 not exactly the same setup, but it's very similar, and I think we probably will see a similar outcome. Um, as I, I was saying, Gauntlet like, said something similar too. 
Like there's a they, whole group of people that went ahead and they've never interacted with Ethereum or Bitcoin. And they're just sitting on the Solana ecosystem and that's essentially their worldview of crypto. And that's their experience and they haven't touched anything else. Yeah. And to be fair, I, I, that's for some people like it, it might be that it's too expensive to transact on mainnet, or it might be that they don't really even see the need. If if you have only used Centesis since Solana, you, you can have a full ecosystem there. Like it's not maybe as developed as uh, Ethereum and you don't see as much uh, innovation right now. But I think that is coming. There's a lot of teams that are doing some very interesting things and, and that will be seen over the coming months and years. The fact that it survived FTX too, that like that shouldn't be underestimated. Like imagine if Vitalik and the entire Ethereum Foundation essentially went to prison after 2017, <laughs> and then ETH rose up anyway. Like that's it's a very um, strong. Like there's a big Lindy factor there with the fact yeah. that it did survive, and now it's the kind of price ascent we're seeing. Yeah, I think that like facing a, an extinction level event um, kind of forms this community in a sense. You, you saw the same for Ethereum. Uh, maybe during the DAO hack and also this ICO death spiral. Um, so if someone is left after that, like you know that they are not going anywhere, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you you have to bet on them. Maybe not. Maybe Solana doesn't grow as much. Uh, or it cannot compete with Ethereum. Maybe it does doesn't get to to that level. But you you cannot like if you have to bet on someone right now. I think it must be them. Not to jump ahead, but you know, you wrote that piece on Solana where it was kind of touching on those green shoots that were starting to rise up and they hadn't quite issued a coin. You know, I, I don't want to jump ahead, but is is are we gonna be yeah, talking but, about those projects here as like kind yeah, of post DTF stuff? That's coming after the ETF, yeah. That's coming after the ETF when you when Solana is at uh, I don't know, five hundred dollars a a, a a coin and you have to go down the risk of to maximize your, your gains, that's when it's coming. <laughs> Well, I want to get there. I want to get there, but I, I think Cody, I, I would, I would say you've made a damn good case for why you could look at Solana as your 10x opportunity. And I think right now we have everyone's opportunity on the table except for Ben. So Ben, jump in here. What do you think is the opportunity right now before the ETF as you're looking at that 10x? Is it were you convinced to follow Cody down the risk curve? Are you looking more at JJ to to just buy and hold until sell, or are you looking more buy the dip? What are you doing? Yeah, you know, Cody, he's gonna start convincing me slowly. I know it. He's gonna probably DM me right after the show and start to to just discuss Solana even more. <laughs> but I, I would even if I end up going down that route, because you got so you you need to consider what Grayscale did to Bitcoin in 2020. Like even though it is just a scary vehicle, like Grayscale pumped Bitcoin insane. Right. There was this grayscale effect that allowed people to go ahead, accumulate Bitcoin on spot, drop it into the trust, get those shares and sell in the market, capture that positive nav, and then recirculate that trade and purchase more Bitcoin. Right. 3AC did this in the order magnitude of billions. Right. This was not insignificant. <laughs> So when you think of Solana and you look at that premium, that is a juicy premium and people are going to attack that. Okay, so we should just be realistic there. It scares me, but I, I have a feeling that Cody's going to convince me in the coming months. But if I were to actually look at Solana, it wouldn't be right now. It's actually going to be later. And the reason being is because I think the ETF, I've mentioned this Bitcoin milkshake, it's been progressing over the past few months. I think just since early September, it's gone from 48% all the way nearly 53%. And for a market that's almost one and a half trillion dollars, like that's a lot. That is a big move. And when we look at the ETF and we kind of talk about what JJ's saying, when we're going to actually see Bitcoin make its move on the news and people might sell that news and that's, that's fine. It's just when that, but when Bitcoin just takes the whole kind of gravitational pull of the ecosystem and all the liquidity starts to move into it, like where, where are you looking? Like, I don't, I'm not quite convinced that Bitcoin is going to be able to do two X and three X in that time period. And that's why I'm looking at miners for that specific reason. I think just because the analogy with gold from back in the day that miners had this 10 X ability while gold was not really going to get you that it was going to get you 10 to 20% possibly over the next two years. 
I think a lot of the individuals that are going to be investing within the equity markets are going to be those that have that mentality. And the, us that are crypto native, like we kind of look past that and we're like, yeah, that's that's just not a good play, right? Like we we kind of see these balance sheets, we see everything that Ray's talking about earlier, all very valid points. But I think just, you know, if you want to use the boomer mentality, like I think that minor narrative is going to grab hold of a lot of the market. It's going to be a quick move. And I think that's where you can find a 2x on the news. Mm. They're very so heavily you're, you're, shorted too, even still. Like I think that's a lot of this price suppression we're seeing with miners is there's just been excessive short interest on those for all like valid reasons. But if Bitcoin breaks out above forty thousand, I think you're going to see these like and they're so low float, low cap that they could just accelerate rather quickly. And we saw that in 2020, 2021 with them as well. Like their gains were just you pull it up since uh last November after the FTX collapse and they're outpacing Bitcoin even though they're beaten down at these levels right now. So I think that is a good trade too. Yeah, okay. I was looking at the calls possibly as a as a way to to gain exposure, but I think we saw that the implied volatility was already you know excess hitting extreme. So those yeah, that are thinking call options with those like they're just so volatile that you can never. It's all relatively cheap fall basically. Mm -hmm. So, so you if anything, into these mining stocks, uh, that's a. Good point, right? Because this is all timing. Because these things can get absolutely destroyed on a day's late. notice. Mm -hmm. And um, for for timing, right? We kind of hit on like this week is kind of that unique period for the SEC to go ahead and like do a blanket approval for all these ETF filings. I would actually say now, like this week going into the weekend, and you don't need to even hold it past Monday or Tuesday up the next week. So 17, 18, 19, 20. So like the 21st, like you could probably already be looking, you know what? This isn't the time, right? In mm -hmm. terms of like the next go at bat, like you're looking at the end of the year, you're looking at going into the maybe a mid-December type of time frame, kind of going into the end of the year holidays that unfold. And for that early January time period for that event to take place, and you kind of already positioned accordingly because if someone's going to front run it, it's happening over the holidays, right? It's mm -hmm. going to happen when likely these markets are kind of closed and it's going to be a little bit more difficult to get that position. So yeah, that's, that's how I would kind of look at this potential news event and how to play it. Okay. Well, just to summarize here, we've got some really interesting uh, divergences and in what, how you guys, the brain trust are thinking about, it. we got JJ who's saying, listen, you can buy and hold looking to sell. We're going to talk about the during in a moment, we got Ray who's saying, listen, to buy the dips. Hopefully you already have some allocation. And again, looking to buy the dip to add more to it. Cody is saying, no, right now, if you really want that 10X, you're going to be looking at Solana. He's making the case for an alt, but specifically Solana. And Ben coming out here with a trade, looking at more of the mining stocks, again, more of a DCA. And I think the one theme I would see from all this is, is being light on the leverage because there's so much uncertainty, even though we're we're looking at a 90% confidence of that ETF. Okay, I want to take us to the next stage because if you're listening, you want to know exactly, okay, so now this is all before the ETF. It could come as soon as this week. Most likely it will be in January. Okay, so now during the, the approval of these ETFs, again, I think I counted 12 on my last count, uh, and you know, many may be approved all at once, or they may be staggered. Uh, we don't know yet. So the question is, now during that time, what do you do? Okay, so you just heard four distinct strategies for maximizing your gains before the approval of the Bitcoin ETF. And now you're wondering, well, what happens when the ETF is approved? Well, that's a great question. And in part two, we unpack how our four analysts are approaching their strategies during and importantly after the launch. And listen, staying in the crypto market is really the only way to get close to this magical 10X. So you're gonna to wanna to hear this episode. And it's coming out very soon. So be sure to like and subscribe to the channel to be notified when it does. And if you're looking for some content, maybe around Solana, before that next video comes out, check out the deep dive. I'll leave it here. You don't wanna miss this.